morning, 9.30. You awake? You are after that buffer video, right? <laughs> Woo. Uh, hey, if uh, you're new to us, welcome. My name is Dom. I serve on staff here as one of our pastors, and I love this church. It is a great place to be, a great community. And if you are new to us, my prayer is that this place starts to feel like home really quickly. And maybe a part of that is just you coming up after service, introducing yourself. I love to hear your name and just a little bit about your story Uh, This morning, we're going to open up our Bibles like we do every Sunday, and we're going to keep going through a series that we're calling Everyday Yes, where we're looking at the New Testament book of James. And what we find in James is we find an early church pastor shepherding Christians to see their faith as an everyday opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And we're going to see that today as we open up God's Word together. In fact, today, the yes that James is going to encourage us to say in our faith is, is a yes to today. A yes to today with Jesus. Every Sunday when we open up our Bibles, we believe that God is speaking, not just to the church then, but the church today. And so before we get into today's message and talk about what it means to say yes to today with Jesus, I think it's really important to just give you the chance to pray. You've heard people pray, but I just want you to be able to have that moment yourself Uh, Before we ever open up God's word, let's just invite him into this time with us. Would you bow your heads with me? And I'm just going to lead you through a time to pray for three people in the room today. The first person I want to invite you to pray for is just yourself. Ask God to speak to you this morning as we open his word. then would you pray for the people around you? Would you ask God to speak to them, our church this morning, as we open his word together? Lastly, would you pray for me? Would you ask God to use me to speak his word faithfully to you today? Jesus, you are worthy of our worship and you are worthy of every yes we could possibly say. And so today, would you come close to us through the power of your spirit, and would you show us what it means to say yes to today with you? We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, right now, there is a social scientist who is kind of making a big splash in the education world. He goes by the name of Jonathan Haidt, and he's written a book recently that's really gotten popular. It's called The Anxious Generation. A lot of educators are reading this book and realizing that it's not a good idea for kids to have phones at school. Imagine that. <laughs> and, and, and in his research, Jonathan Haidt is, is pointing out how technology is one of the variables making more and more kids anxious today. It's just one of many variables, but when he looks at the next generation, meaning Gen Z, Gen Alpha, he is seeing a trend that that this technology in our pockets has an unintended consequence. It's making us anxious, and this anxiety is coming through all the distractions that our phone gives us. Now, whether you're in Gen Z or Alpha or not, the truth is we are living in a day and age that is more distracted than humans have ever faced before. Like, like we are living in a distracted world. I mean, think about it. What, what do these things do to you when you're driving? They distract you, right? We should work on that, okay? <laughs> How about when you're in public? They distract you, right? I, I love when I get to go to like a Cavs game and up on the Jumbotron in between quarters, kiss cam comes on, right? And the 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 camera guys are scanning the crowd, trying to look for a couple to peer pressure into kissing in front of thousands of people, right? Why do we get entertainment out of this, by the way? I don't know, but we all love it deep down. And every once in a while when the kiss cam gets onto a couple, what's what's going on? Usually the dude right here, right? He is so sucked in, or, or she is so sucked into her phone that they're missing what's going on right in front of them. And it's on a jumbotron for thousands of people to see. But let's just get honest with ourselves. This happens to us at home, doesn't it? Because even when we're at home with people we love most, let me just be vulnerable with you. There's been many times I've been sitting right next to my wife and I've just been sucked into an email or so caught up in my news feed that I am missing what matters most right in front of me. And as a loving spouse, she has tapped me on the shoulder a few times and reminded me 
that the distraction isn't worth it. She's, she's had to tell me, hey, Dom, I love you enough to tell you to put your phone down. Like, like what matters most is right here and right now. And that's what James is going to do for us this morning, right? He is lovingly, in the passage that we're going to read together, he's going to tap us on the shoulder, and he's going to tell us that living distracted lives is just not worth it when it comes time to saying yes to today with Jesus. Because here's the big idea that you're going to see coming out of this passage and out of this sermon. It's that Jesus desires to have a present life with you. That's at the heart of Christ. He, he wants a present life with with you. He's not waiting for you to die to start a life with you. Now what we see in scripture, what you're going to see today is that James and, and really Christians for thousands of years have been calling one another to live present lives with Christ. Lives that say yes to today with him. We're going to see this really come to life as we open our Bible. So if you have a Bible, would you open it to James chapter 4? James chapter 4. We're going to read uh, verses 13 all the way to the end of chapter 4. And then we're going to read the first five verses of chapter 5. Okay, so we're going to read nine verses together spanning two chapters. And here are kind of three points that will outline this morning's message as we look at this passage. Number one, if you're a note taker, this is helpful. We're going to see James pointing out some distractions. He's going to call them out. He's going to label them for us. And then number two, he's going to speak the truth to us about these distractions. And then lastly, we're going to see that there is a way forward for us as Christians to live lives that are present with Jesus, lives that say yes to today with him. So let's read scripture together. If you have a Bible, meet me in James 4, verse 13. That's where we're going to start. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. It'll be up on screen. This is what James says in his own words. He says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and then fails to do it, for him it is sin. Then chapter 5 begins. This is what James says. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you. It'll actually eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. This is God's word, and it's true. Anybody feel encouraged this morning? Yeah? <laughs> James is that friend who will just say it how it is, and that's what he's doing this morning. I think you and I can walk out of this morning encouraged if we really sit with the truth that he's laying in front of us, and that brings us to point one of this morning's message, which is the distractions. What James is doing in these nine verses is he's really highlighting two types of distracted lives that he sees in his everyday pastoring. Remember, James is a early church pastor, living everyday life with everyday Christians, and he notices that there's two trends in our lives that will often distract us from just living a present life with Christ. And I wonder if you notice these two types of people that James introduces us to in this passage. Let's just isolate the two verses where he introduces these two people to us up on screen right now. Uh, he, he really describes one person in chapter 4, verse 13, and then he describes the other person in chapter 5, verse 1. Let's go ahead and put those verses up there. So in chapter 4, this is how he describes the first person. In verse 13, this, this is what he says. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. What kind of person is James describing here? He's describing a busy person. Right? Somebody who is so caught up in their plans and what's coming next that they're forgetting to live a present life with Christ. This hits home for me. I love being busy. 
It makes me feel productive. And so did this person in chapter 4. Right? They are so caught up in their plans. They know exactly what's going to happen next. They're going to go to this place. They're going to set up shop. They're going to make some money. And life's going to be good. And yet James says, this is one of the ways that we can live a distracted life from just being present with Jesus. But he describes a second person in verse 1 of chapter 5, which is up on screen. He says this, too. He says, come now, you rich, and weep. How? There's going to be miseries coming upon you. So who is the second person that James is highlighting here for us? He's highlighting people who have a lot of stuff. The, the wealthy, the rich. So right here, right now, James is inviting two types of people to come with him because he has some things he wants to tell us. And if James is standing here today, inviting those two types of people to come with him because he has some things to show them, this whole room should clear out and go with James. Okay, because whether we realize it or not, these two trends, these two types of distracted living are all over American life today, right? You and I, we are incredibly busy people. We also have a lot of stuff. And, and you might be looking at me and saying, Dom, you don't know my tax bracket, okay? I, I don't have as much as those people, is James really talking to me? And yet, when we take a step back and look globally, if you're an American, no matter what your tax bracket is, you are in the top 5% of wealth today. And, oh, by the way, if you just look at history, humans have never had so much stuff as we do today in all of human history. So, so when James is writing this, what I want to encourage you to do with just this first point, when he's talking about distractions, would you lean in instead of tuning out? Like, like don't try to sidestep what he's saying here. Because these actually might be real distractions in your life today. If you're just willing to be honest with yourself and the Bible, and what James is telling us is that these are distractions that will keep us from living presently with Jesus. And, and just to boil it down right here, he's saying that our schedules and our wallets often distract us from valuing Jesus and living presently with him. This is what James is seeing in his everyday pastoral life in the church then, and if I'm being honest, as a pastor today, and Todd and Brandon would confirm this, this is also what we see in our own lives when we get distracted from living presently with Jesus, but also this is what we see in your life. When you come to us and, and say, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I know something's off. Often, it is a distraction that's causing something to be off in our walk with the Lord. It's often our schedules. It's often our wallets, and yet it's not limited to that, okay? There's an election in three weeks. How many of us have been really distracted with it? So much so that we've forgotten how to pray. Like we've forgotten how just to show up on a day-to-day -day basis with Jesus. Also, um, you know, Wednesday nights, I get together with our middle schoolers. Logan gets together with our high schoolers. We do discipleship on Wednesday nights, and in a room packed with middle schoolers, we taught this passage this past Wednesday, it's interesting because your middle schoolers aren't clinging to their wallets, okay? They don't really have a concept of a bank account yet, all right? They're also not checking their Microsoft Outlook calendar about work tomorrow. Like, that's just not their life right now. And yet, when we talked through this, I don't think there was a single middle schooler who couldn't identify a distraction in their life at school or at home or online. They were honest enough with themselves to say, yeah, like, I can live a life that's distracted, from just being present with Jesus. And so if we as a church today are just willing to be as honest as our middle schoolers were on Wednesday, like what might start to bubble to the surface for you this morning? What might be distracting you from living a present life with Jesus? And let me just make a side comment here. Like your schedule and your wallet, they're not bad things. Like James isn't saying drop them. Like give up your bank account, give up having an organized life. That's not what he's talking about. These are good gifts to steward, just like the kids who were up here on stage with their parents. Like, those kids are gifts that we are to steward well. And yet, if these gifts become distractions from just living presently with Jesus, we start to find problems in our lives. Which brings me to point two of this morning's message, which is the truth. James wants to give us some truth about these distractions, and what you'll see as you keep reading is he's hoping to disarm the distractions with the truth, right? Jesus himself said the truth sets people free, and so what James is going to do as he keeps writing is he's going to give us the truth about these distractions in a hope to disarm them for us. 
So this is point two of this morning's message. What's the truth about these distractions that James is calling out for us? Well, number one, let's just look at the person he describes in chapter four, that busy person. Here's what he says the truth is about our schedules. Do you see it in verse 14? James says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. What James is trying to do is we kind of lean in and admit to ourselves that often our schedules keep us from being present with Jesus. James is trying to give us some truths about just how temporary some things are. Right? First, he says, um, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. Right? Every flat tire I've ever gotten, I think, was a mercy from God, just reminding me I'm not in control. Right? I told you I'm somebody who's tempted to just get distracted in all my plans, and that keeps me from being present with Jesus sometimes. And, and yet what I find is when I get distracted in all my plans, often what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to grasp for some sense of control in my life. Like I can control my life if I plan everything. And yet James walks into the room today and he pops that balloon. Uh-uh. You're not in control, Dom. You're not, you're not in control today. You can't control what happens next. And so again, this is truth that James is lovingly giving us to disarm that distraction. Saying, don't get caught up in that distraction. It's not worth your time. And then he takes a step further. He speaks kind of in a way that might offend some people. He says, hey, what is your life? Right? He says, isn't it just a miss? It's here for a little while, and then it's gone the next day. What James is doing here is really, he's pulling from Old Testament wisdom. He's kind of quoting the book of Ecclesiastes, which tells us that when we take a step back and look at the scope of eternity, our lives are but a vapor. And, and what the Bible is trying to show us isn't, it's not trying to tell you that, that your life doesn't matter or, or it's insignificant. That's not the message at all. But what James is trying to do for us is he's just asking us to take a step back and remember that all these distractions that we're so caught up in, they're really just temporary things when we take a step back. And those temporary things that become distractions, they, they make us lose sight of what's eternal. And that's, that's what James is fighting here. He, he, he's here fighting for the truth in your life that, that having all these plans and being distracted with them is not worth giving up an eternal perspective over. So if you need help today, if you're kind of lost in all of your own plans, if you're just busy, too busy to be present with Jesus, James just needs you to hear today that really all this stuff is temporary. And hopefully that truth can disarm those distractions so much so that you can just take a step back and see what really is eternal, what does last forever, what truly matters. James is about to do the same thing when he addresses our wallets, when he's talking to the people who are distracted by all their stuff, by their wealth. Join me in, in chapter 5. This is the truth about our wallets, according to James. Listen to what he says. He says, Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Okay, what, what's James saying here about our stuff, about our wallets? He's saying, just like our plans, our stuff is temporary. Did you catch what he said in, in verse 2? He said, your riches have rotted. Do you know that when the Federal Reserve is printing new money, before it gets distributed, they have to treat it with chemicals because they know that the paper that your money's printed on is in a state of decay already. Like, they've just printed it, and they, they realize, hey, this stuff is about to rot, so we should treat it with some chemicals. Quite literally, our wealth is in a state of decay already. J James is highlighting that for us. And then what, what does he say about our our clothes, that, that Gucci, that, you know, your, your top Prada brand, whatever. I don't know what brand you're obsessed with, but he calls it moth food. He says one day it's going to break down. It's not going to be here. Again, he's, he's trying to get us rooted in, like, this is just temporary stuff. And then he starts to touch our shiny things, right? He talks about gold and silver, but what about what's parked in the driveway, right? What are the shiny things in your life? He says, at some point, it's going to corrode. At some point, it's going to rust. Again, he's disarming these distractions by just reminding us it's all temporary. And yet, we live with the reality of eternity. 
right? And, and as he shares these truths with us, what James is trying to anchor us to for these two distractions are these two truths. He's trying to anchor us to this. Number one, we're not in control. Number two, we live with expiration dates. These are the two truths we find in this passage as James addresses two types of people who are living distracted lives, so distracted that they can't see that what Jesus wants for them is a present life with himself. What I'm about to say next is really, I think, at the heart of James as a pastor. So if you have checked out, welcome back. Okay, this is the 930 service. I need your attention, okay? If you're going to miss everything but this, I think it's, it's going to be important for you to hear. I, really, the truth that James has given us is that nothing we will ever plan, nothing we will ever accumulate will outlast or outvalue a life lived presently with Christ. That's what he's saying here. I'll just say it again. It's, it's a big paragraph. It's a mouthful to say, but it's worth us hearing again. The truth is that nothing we will ever plan or accumulate will outlast or outvalue a life lived intentionally present with Christ. Nothing. No number in your bank account, no trip you can plan will outvalue or outlast just what a present life with Jesus can give you. That's what he's trying to point us to today. But the question is, do you believe that? <laughs> do you actually believe that? And I just want to pause here and speak to you. If you're here this morning and you're just honest enough with yourself to say, hey, I don't identify as a Christian, but I'm here because someone invited me. I'm here because I, I have questions. I just want to see what the Bible says. First and foremost, thanks for being here. Like, keep coming. Keep opening your Bible with us and seeing what God has to say. But I, I need you to hear this morning just a simple invitation. And it's an invitation to come and know what a clear life with God can be for you. Right? Because this is what happens. Sin distracts us. And by the way, the Bible says everybody has sinned. Like in Romans, Paul tells us everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. We've all gotten distracted with things that really don't matter. And because of those distractions, we have walked away from God. And yet, Jesus comes on a rescue mission. What we read in the Gospels is that when Jesus shows up, he's here to seek and save the lost. The lost, meaning the distracted. Meaning all those people who were too busy for him. Meaning all those people who loved their stuff more than they loved God. That's who Jesus came for. That's who he laid down on the cross for and bled and died for. That's who he resurrected for. That's who he is calling into new life with God this morning. If you're willing to just say, hey, I've been living distracted too long and I want a new and clear life with God, a life marked by purpose and significance and identity, you can have that today by coming and knowing Jesus because a present life with him will outlast and outvalue anything else you could grab hold on in this world. If that's you this morning, if you want to take a step towards Jesus today in faith, would you come up after service? Would you talk to me? Would you talk to a prayer team member? We would love to walk you through that and help you make that decision and know what it means. Or if you just want to right now in your seat pray that, you can tune me out for the next few minutes, okay? Because you talking to God about that matters more. You just saying, hey God, I've been living distracted for too long and I don't like it. And I know these distractions are because I have this problem called sin, and yet you have a solution for my sin, and it is forgiveness through your son Jesus. He died for me. I want to trust him. I want to put my faith in him. I want to live life with him now. God, would you give that to me? If that's you, just tune me out and, and just talk to God about that. Because this brings us to point three of this morning's message, which is what's the way forward? Like, how do you and I live present lives with Jesus, the kind of life that says yes to today with him. The reason why I just invited people to think about maybe responding to Jesus for the first time this morning because Jesus is the one who is really the, the starting point of life with God. Like if you want a present life with God, it comes through you just knowing his son Jesus. And yet for us as Christians, uh, we will wake up tomorrow morning and we'll be tempted to get distracted with things still even though we know Jesus, right? And so, so as we end this message, I just want to give you a few ways that you can practice a present life with Jesus this week, staying committed to just saying yes to today with him. So here it is. The, the, the way that, that you and I can live intentionally present with Christ 
comes through belonging to him and being content in him. So we're going to talk about belonging and contentment as we close this message. Uh, When we zoom out of the book of James and we just look at how the New Testament uh, shows us how Christians live intentionally present lives with Jesus, we see that it kind of always comes back to them understanding that they belong to Jesus and that they can truly be content in him. So let's start with belonging. Let's talk about belonging. I think one of the best ways to illustrate this for you is to show you something that a group of Christians wrote a few hundred years ago. They lived in a city in Germany called Heidelberg. A group of Christians there decided to write a catechism. If you didn't grow up in a tradition that used catechisms, let me just explain what a catechism is to you. A catechism is a series of questions and answers that Christians put together as they read their Bibles and as they looked to apply the Bible to their lives. So that's all a catechism is. It's just questions and answers. And so this group of Christians in Germany living in Heidelberg put together a series of questions and answers that came out of their reading of Scripture. Just listen to one question and one answer that I think talks about belonging in a significant way. This is one of the questions in the Heidelberg Catechism. It's this. What is your only comfort in life and death? It's a good question. But, but listen to how these Christians answered it as they read their Bibles. They said this, that I'm not my own, but belong with both body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So these Christians, they're, they're looking at their lives and they're, they're saying, hey, what can be my comfort? What can be my hope in life and in death? Basically saying, what can be my hope and what can be my comfort for today and for tomorrow, right? Like, like I don't know when I'm going to die, but, but what can be my hope and comfort for both now in the present and in the future? And their answer was, as they read the Bible, that they could belong to Jesus both now and then. Like, Like, they could belong to Jesus today. Like, they could live a present life with him today, and that life could give them comfort and hope, and that that life would be for them in tomorrow, one day when they would pass away. Jesus would be waiting for them. But what I want you to hear in this question and answer is the fact that belonging for these Christians drove them into a present hope, into a present comfort, into a present life with Jesus. And it's not by accident. It's because they wrote this as they read the Bible. And when they read the New Testament, they realized that when people put their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, they received a present life with him that very day. Jesus wasn't going to be waiting around till they died to start a life with them. And that's what this belonging is, is talking about. Listen, um, probably the best way to illustrate this is to talk about how the Bible speaks about marriage. Marriage is where two people belong to one another. And in that belonging, those two people show up each and every day to that relationship, right? We know that healthy marriages are marriages where both people are present each and every day. They show up, and they're with their spouse. They're growing. They're going through the hard things together. And yet, in a marriage— What happens when one person checks out? The marriage falls in on itself, right? Because in that belonging, there is an understanding that there should be a presence that follows it. Like, I should show up each day if I truly belong to this person. So let's apply this to our life with God. What happens when you and I check out? We say, hey, God, I'll show up on Sunday, but I'm not going to be around Monday through Saturday. Can you expect that kind of relationship with him to grow? No, often you might be feeling like it's just falling in on itself. And it's because you haven't allowed your belonging to Jesus to drive you into a daily presence with him. And yet that's what it's meant to do. Like, can we just clear out some time each day just to be with Jesus, just to show up and invest in that relationship that we have with him? Because we belong to him. And he belongs to us. And he has promised to show up each and every day for us. You hear that in the Great Commission when he tells his disciples, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you from this day to the very end. What is he promising? He's promising to show up every day. Because he belongs to them and they belong to him. Are you showing up? Are you just saying yes to today with Jesus because you belong to him and he belongs to you? This is why Christians talk about a quiet time. 
This is why we develop a daily rhythm of, of reading our Bibles and having a prayer life. It's because we belong to Jesus and we just need to show up. We just need to be with him because he is ours and we are his. This is the hope of the gospel. This is uh, how people start to speak like James encourages us to speak in chapter 4, verse 15. You know, in chapter 4, James is talking about busy people, people who are just in such a rush that they forget to, like, actually just have a present life with Christ. And yet, he tells us, hey, instead of just getting lost in all your plans and not having time for Jesus, this is how you should live. This is how you should speak. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. What is James saying here? He's saying we should be the kind of people who show up each and every day just asking Jesus what he wants from that day. That's what it means for God to have a will. His will is he has desires for you in your life that he wants you to know about. But you and I won't know about them until we show up and just ask him, hey, Lord, what is your will? You know, this is again a part of belonging, is is speaking like this and living like this, just showing up and asking Jesus what he wants from each and every day, saying yes to that day with him. For the sake of time, let's keep moving to contentment. Let's talk about contentment. Not a word we really use today. But listen to what the Apostle Paul tells a younger pastor in 1 Timothy. He's mentoring a pastor named Timothy. He writes him a letter, and he tells this young pastor Timothy that godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, and we can't take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. What is Paul trying to tell his, his younger pastor who he's mentoring? He's saying, hey, Timothy, if you want to grow as a pastor, if you want to grow as a Christian, it boils down to you just showing up each day and saying yes to that day with Jesus and learning what it means to be content in him. He says, godliness with contentment is of great gain. But as I said earlier, contentment's not really something we think about today. Contentment's not something that we, we really use to describe ourselves often because we live in a culture that's obsessed with ambition, right? The next thing, the next promotion, and yet, biblically defined, contentment is this. It's being so grounded in the present with the Lord that you can see his goodness right in front of you. That, that's what contentment is. It's not looking to the past or looking to the future to try to find his goodness. Now, that's a good thing to do in worship, but that's not what we're talking about in contentment. Contentment is just saying, hey, I'm so present in the here and now that I can see God's goodness that's right in front of me. And so if belonging is really pushing us to just show up and and carve out time for Jesus, what contentment is doing is it's helping us see just how much goodness God has put in his son for us to have each and every day. I want you to hear something that a Christian author wrote. His name's Brother Lawrence. He wrote a book called The Practice of the Presence of God. This is how he described his life with God. He said, There is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of a continual conversation with God, and those only can comprehend it who practice and experience it. What is Brother Lawrence saying? He's saying, hey, I have learned that saying yes to today with Jesus, because I belong to him, leads me into the sweetest and most delightful life I could ever have. Like, nothing else I could grab onto could give me that kind of life. This is the kind of contentment that happens when we say yes to today with Jesus. Is this the kind of contentment that you have in your life right now, or is this something that we need to to work on? We just need to start showing up and seeing God's goodness in the here and now that he's given us through his son, Jesus. Uh, We have, we've talked through a lot this morning, okay? And I'm about to take my seat, don't worry. (laughs) But before I do, um, I just want to ask you, what's next? Like, when you leave this place, what are you going home to? Here's my fear, um, that we, we sit through church, we kind of go through the motions, and then we leave this place, and we just think about lunch, okay? If that's you, this morning might have been a waste. My hope is that as we encounter God's word, we respond to it. Because I just want you to hear one sentence that James said in chapter 4. Maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. But in James 4, 17, he says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and then fails to do it, for him it is sin. What James is saying is it's not enough to just show up to church and go through the motions. Just to know all the right things. Like, that's not it, guys. What matters most is what you do next in response to God's word. 
So again, w- would you just consider responding this morning? And I want to give you space to do that. So as I take my seat, what, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to close this message in prayer, and then we're going to just give you a minute or two of just silence to quietly reflect and, and talk to the Lord about where you're at, whether that's just confessing a distraction or asking him for help so that you can really show up each and every day knowing that you belong to him and be content in him. Here's the prayer prompt I'm going to give you just for that moment or two of of silence. This is something you can pray, just a sentence to Jesus, asking him, Jesus, show me how to have a present life with you. Would you just spend the quiet times that we give you in the next few minutes just asking that question and letting him speak to you? But right now, would you just enter into a time of prayer with me where you would just say yes to right now with Jesus, just being present with him and letting this question work some things out in your head and your heart. So would you bow your head with me now as we go into this time of prayer. Jesus, we come and we confess that we live distracted lives. We are so sorry about that. We've taken good things and we've, we've made them ultimate things and they've distracted us from just being present with you. But Lord, right now we just ask you to teach us to belong with you and to be content in you. Jesus, would you speak to us now as we open our ears to listen to you.